But Bambi Smith is actually featured on Bravo's Fashion Queens. Um, before that, she's also worked for Rolling Stone. She was their uh, fashion director of advertising there. She hosts incredible dinners where she actually connect marketers with brands. She also connects influencers at those dinners. Companies, huge companies hire her just to put the right people in the room together for her dinners with Bevy. She also does uh, Dinner with Bevy, Life with Vision, where she interviews everyone who's gonna be um, accepted into this program. So if you're gonna be accepted in this program, you have to be tight. And she makes sure that everybody in the room should be in the room, and there she mentors. She mentors me, personally. Bevy Smith sits on HFR's advisory board. Um, she was actually one of our very first advisory board members. And sometimes when you're in this industry, people take, they wait to see if you're gonna be successful before they sign on to your dreams. I can honestly say, just personally, Bevy Smith actually met with me before she knew what knew what Harlem's fashion world was going to be. We had only been around for a couple of years. I emailed her many times, and she agreed to have a meeting with me and sat there and really poured out whatever knowledge I needed. And so, for me, this is really a treat because she's someone that I personally really respect and admire what she's been able to accomplish as an entrepreneur. Uh, and also as a media personality. It's not easy what she's been able to do, um, but she makes it look so incredibly fabulous. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you guys to Miss Debbie Smith. All right, Ed. And Bevy, I am actually just gonna jump right in. And I want you to tell us about, because a lot of the students in the audience I've had a chance to speak with and hear a little bit of their nervousness in terms of graduating from school and what their first jobs are going to be right out of school. Can you tell us what your first real job was in media? My first real job in fashion was as a receptionist at a really great um, advertising agency. And um, this is the olden days of, huh, before there were actually computers, if you can believe that. I know you guys are like, what? But yeah, there were no computers around, so I actually had to do the old call up and, you know, do you have job open, these kind of things. Um, and that was one of the most important jobs that I've ever had in my entire career, and I'll tell you why. As a receptionist, which is the lowest rung in the, uh, in, in the corporate space, right? But I realized that as the receptionist, I was the keeper of the keys. I was the first face that everyone uh, who came into the, the office, I was the first face that they saw. And I was the one who was um, the welcoming party. So I was the hostess. And I took my job very seriously. Um, and so instead of being lackadaisical about my job and like reading magazines and someone coming in and you're barely looking up and you're like, hey, who are you here to see? And just like, you know, calling the person and being just kind of like disdainful of the whole process. Instead, what I did was I would look people directly in the eye, welcome to Peter Rogers and Associates, may I help you? They would tell me who they were here to see. I would take their coat. I was not required to take their coat. I would ask them if they wanted something to drink. I was not required to do that. That was not my job description. But because I went above and beyond, when I was the low girl on the totem pole, the executives noticed that. And from there, I was promoted quite quickly. And I saw that, um, and then they kind of put me in position to start my career as a media director. Awesome. What was your, uh, how did you get to Rolling Stone? What was that process like? Like, how did they find Oh, that was a very you? long process. So, I was, um, so from being a receptionist, I became a media planner. Um, and that is when you are um, in advertising and you're the person who tells your client what magazines or newspapers or TV shows that they should actually be advertising on to kind of connect with that perfect consumer. So I became a media planner and then I left and I went to another advertising agency where I became the vice president and media director by the time I was 28 years old. Um, and then it was there that I began to go to Paris for the fashion shows because my boss was a really big, big, big deal in the fashion community. 
and he thought that I could be a really big deal in the fashion community. So he sent me to Paris for the first time by myself for the shows. And I, I'm from Harlem. And um, I had never been out of the country, and I did not speak French. And he was just like, you'll be fine. You have the skill set that's needed. On that, on that note is that, you know, whenever you're given an opportunity, even if you're scared, go for it. Mm -hmm. Do not let fear make you stagnant. Do not let fear cause you to kind of like second guess yourself. If you're given a great opportunity, you should go for it. So um, my, my boss was really awesome and I was, you know, doing really well in my career and then I realized that I was no longer happy doing what I was doing. And so I was, you know, kind of listless. And I'm also a firm believer in if you don't want a job, don't stay on the job and do a crappy job. Simply find a new job or resign from that job because there's someone else who that would be their dream job. How many of y'all sitting up for jobs that y'all hate and being half you know what at it? There's someone else though that would love that same job. So you kind of have to think, you know, count your blessings. And I was the type of person who I said, it would be a disservice for me to stay on this job and not really love it anymore more and not do a great job. So I resigned. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I, and I got a call from Essence Magazine, and I went over there and had a great um, interview, and then I decided that wasn't the right place. And then I got a call from Vibe Magazine, and they wanted me to become their fashion advertising director. And I was really kind of like hesitant to do so because I had came from a general market um, background. So do you guys know the difference between kind of general market and then multicultural? So in layman's terms, general market gen generally means everybody but really white folks. And then multicultural is everything other, you know, and doing. I got a great opportunity. That's okay. I want you guys to remember this opportunity. I had a great opportunity when my boss at Vibe said, we want you to host the red carpet of the Vibe Awards with Farnsworth Bentley. And I was like, well, I've never done that, but it sounds like a great opportunity, so I'm going to take it. I did it, and I was good at it, and I loved it. And I was like, maybe I could have a career in television. <laughs> so I started plotting. And I was like, but well, I don't want to leave my nice, cushy job. Because it was a nice, cushy job. Like, <laughs> six figures. And then I got a call from Rolling Stone, and they had seen all the work that I'd done for five, and they said, we're the largest so we want you to come and work for us because if you could do all of that for that magazine, we can only imagine what you could do for us. And I said, you know, I'm not really interested. And they said, we'll pay you two thousand dollars more than what you already paid. <laughs> Okay, good. 
what was that process for you between the time you left Rolling Stone to the time you got the opportunity on Bravo's Fashion Queens? Ah, look. I wish I could tell you lovely young people that I quit my job at Rolling Stone and then the next month I got Bravo's Fashion Queens, but it didn't happen that way. I knew I wanted to be a fashion pop culture commentator. I knew I wanted to be an entertainment reporter. Um, so I knew that there was a skill set that was needed. Um, when you know you're on reality TV, you're just like flying off the cuff and just doing whatever. But you know, on my job at Fashion Queen, you have to read a teleprompter. My, my entire show is scripted on my bits, but you would never know that because I read it so convincingly. <laughs> yes, and now we have blah, 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 and you know, and it's very conversational. But that's a skill set. I went to school for that, guys. I took classes for that. So I took my after, time. After your job at Rolling Stone? After my job at Rolling Stone. Okay. So after Rolling Stone, I took acting classes, improv classes, because you have to be quick off the cuff when you're doing, when you're interviewing people especially. Because you have to kind of like go with the flow. So right now, Brandis has a script, but she's not going off that script. If I say something that piques her interest, she's going to veer off and ask something to piggyback on what I just said. That's the mark of a great interviewer. So improv helps that skill side. So when I went back to Bob, I, I took T.I. to Milan. He had never been out of the country. I took him to Milan for Fashion Week. Um, you know, I was saying that Kanye, the first trip to Milan, he didn't know anything. I took him around and showed him different um, things in, in Milan. Um, you know, great, great, great opportunities as an editor at large. Um, and then what happened is that that I started getting put on TV by five. So every time you saw something on VH1 or BET and it's like it's the crime, you know, it says on the bottom, XYZ editor, so that was me. So it was like fashion editor at large at five, weighs in on the fabulous life of Kamora Lee Simmons or Kanye West or what have you. So that was my gig. But you have to have a skill set to even do that, guys. You know, I showed that I could write. So I sent him writing samples. Um, and then, of course, I had already all the amazing relationships with the fashion industry, so they felt very confident that I could be an editor at large. And um, I did these really great shoots um, twice a year where I like, did six pages of fashion with one celebrity, which was so much fun. Like, you know, I shot Chris Brown and um, Usher, like lots of fabulous people. And those relationships, the things I did at Vibe as the fashion editor at large, then translated into my business of dinner with Bevy. Because then I had all these relationships with all these celebrities. So it worked out real nice. So guys, the, the thing I want you to know is that everything that you do has the, the possibility of being, um, that you can piggyback onto it at, uh, for success, or it can kind of squash your dreams if you do a bad job. So whatever job you're doing, always give it your all because the experience, the knowledge, the people that you're going to meet, they're all going to be reference points for you somewhere in your life. Awesome. What, are some, what were some of your biggest challenges as you were looking to get into media? So we know it took a while before you were able to it get It took eight fashion. years to get, wow. get fashion queens from the time I quit Rolling Stone. But I will say this, I had a lot of other job, um, a lot of TV opportunities. Um, everyone has, every network has approached me about being on a reality show and I was like, I'm not interested in having my personal life exposed for public father. Um, I, don't, I don't find that an honorable thing to do and I have amazing parents that sacrifice for me so that I wouldn't have to do something like that. So if you don't ever catch Barry Smith on television, you know, cavorting with men and brawling with her friends. I might do that in my personal life. <laughs> but it won't be on TV. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I had a lot of opportunities to do reality shows and I turned them down. But then I also had great opportunities. Like, you know, I had a pilot at um, BET um, for a mentoring show called The Bevy Way, which was going to be a show where I would meet young people like you and then I would like be a fairy godmother and make you over and, and put you on the path for a great career. I guess I was too positive. I guess if I, would, if I was hitting one of y'all upside the head, they would have gave me the show. 
Um, I had a great show opportunity on, um, on Oxygen called Mary Queen of Shops that was a shopping show. So I've had lots of different opportunities, but none of them really went. But in the meantime, in between time, I had all these other things. Like um, McDonald's has been one of my great, uh, you know, um, supporters. I've done a myriad of projects with them. Um, and lots of great corporations so that I wouldn't have to just take anything. So I'm very grateful for that. But it took eight years. And in that time, you have to be able to support yourself. So one of the things I really want to also say to you guys is that it's very important have a job, but also always approach even your job with an entrepreneurial spirit. And what I mean by that is you take the initiative. Yes, of course, you have a job description. But just like when I was a receptionist and I had that job description, which was answer phones and greet guests, I took it a step further by taking the coats and getting the coffee and different things like that. So always take the initiative, and, and taking the initiative is an entrepreneurial um, credo, and it will serve you well in your life. And by the time my savings ran out, I was probably making $35,000. So imagine making six figures, and then making five figures, and low five figures. So that's a huge, huge, huge transition in your lifestyle that you have to make. So now all of a sudden, you know, forget about buying Givenchy or Vuitton or any of that. Now you're actually selling the stuff that you own, you know, which never bothered me at all because I knew I was on a mission. I was on a path. So the fact that I was broke but doing what I loved, oh my God, I was so happy, guys. I was like, I don't have no money, but I'm writing this article for Essence, and I'm, you know, going to take this VH1 special. I was just so giddy, even though I was broke. Do you guys even, can you imagine, like, does that, yes. does that even remotely resonate with you, doing yes. something that you absolutely love, something that you would do for free, and you are practically doing for free, and it makes you just so happy? And that's where I was at with it, because I knew that eventually, I would have the opportunity to actually make money at doing what I love. And I'm happy to say now, I have a totally different financial situation, and I'm doing what I love, I love, and I pay well for it. So that's that's the turnaround. Love it. But if I had quit, I would have never gotten to this place. Was there ever a time where you thought about quitting? I never thought about quitting. It was too late to turn back. At that point, I was like, you know, gosh, the, during my roughest time, I was like maybe 45. 44. I was like, I ain't going back to get no job. I'm already halfway in, halfway down the, the path. So I just was like, let me stick to it. It never really occurred to me to quit. What would you tell the younger Bevy? So oh, the Bevy at this Bevy. age. Yeah, this Bevy, I would tell her to not be distracted by a boy. And it's the first time I really realized I had an analytical mind. But it was analytical in a very kind of um, in a very not basic, but in a very real, authentic kind of way. So I'm I'm really I'm very book smart, but the way I approach it is in a very kind of relatable manner, which works really well for TV. Because people can connect with you, but yet you're smart enough to impart knowledge. And that's what you need. Um, I also, if um, I could talk to my younger self, I would say, start journaling and keep your, and always have a vision board. How many of you guys here have vision boards? Yeah, that's what I want to see. Now, when I come back next year, I want to see everybody with a vision board. I never had a vision board, but um, I can successfully say that having vision boards later in life, a really the, uh, one of the tools that I use to really kind of propel myself into the successful field that I'm in now. Um, and just kind of like believing in yourself, but also being real with yourself. So I'm going to just say that most times I go to school, everyone wants to be in fashion because they want to be a model. No man, no sir. Very few people that are successful models that make enough money 
to not only just survive, but to thrive in it. And uh, Bebby, a lot of the students here want to get into fashion design, styling. I love it. Now let's talk about styling. Well, what are some of the biggest misconceptions? What, what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions are about those industries and the fashion industry as a whole? Okay, so the biggest misconception about the fashion industry is that the fashion industry is all about showing up the work fly, beat to the guards. Yeah, they can't touch you. You slay it, girl, and then it's nothing to do with the business. I swear to you guys, those people that you see during Fashion Week with all that stuff on, they don't even have big jobs. The people that really work in fashion have nice clothes, but you won't, they won't scream anything. You know what I mean? The, the outfit won't be like, you never peacocking in fashion if you're working in fashion. Because you don't have time for it, right? So the professors here, they know. You know, if you're really trying to get your work done, then do you really have time to put on a hat and then don a feather in the hat and then do a, a, a scarf and then do a laser with a brooch and then do a skirt with a, you know, a ruching and then do a closure and then do a shoot of the child and then you have to got a bad girl. <laughs> you late for work. <laughs> So, you know, fashion, it's all, obviously, you should have a good sense of style. You should have a good eye. But it's not about you. Your, your fashion is not about you. You are there to serve the consumer. Or if you're a stylist, you're there to serve your client. You know, June Ambrose is a very good friend of mine. June, June Ambrose paid her dues so she could show up on set given June Ambrose. I call it universe. <laughs> Because, you know, I'm just like, every time I see it, I'm like, ooh, June Verbs, I just, June Verbs. <laughs> but she paid her dues. When she was a young, fledgling stylist, when she was working at something that you guys don't even remember, she had a job at Cross Colors. <laughs> and she didn't look like that. She paid her dues. So now she can come on set and be, yes, June. <laughs> She's a bigger star than most of the stars, you know? <laughs> know about the business of fashion. It's not just showing up like, with Louboutins on and all that madness. Like, that's cute, good for you. Oh, you got nice clothes on. But what can you do? What do you know? How can you make this organization better? Love it. Bevy, you actually mentor a lot of people who are doing incredible things in fashion right now. And I'm sure that there was something that you recognized in those people. What is kind of the common trait that you can see among people who really make it in fashion? Okay, the common trait of the kids that I mentor is always big on learning. Um, I just posted on my Instagram page, like I, I very rarely post like designer stuff, fashion stuff, because that's, you know what, all you need is a credit card to, to buy all that stuff. It doesn't prove anything. I just posted a library card. I just renewed my library card like uh, three days ago. And on my show, we have a segment called The Reading Room. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, the reading room is officially open because even when I'm reading someone on television, and I can do it in a more erudite and intellectual way, it makes it so much chicer than just like, you look crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? So reading gives you that. When you're reading great literature, you're going to pick up certain kind of terms, you're going to have a certain amount of knowledge, and you'll be able to have these references. So the people that I mentor, traditionally, they're always young people that are well read. Because they have something to talk about besides, like if all you can do is tell me about Olivier, and Ricardo, and Tom, and, and you just don't know what they're referencing, I, I just don't have too much use for it. What are some of the other traits that you think would make these students successful in fashion? Um, the ability to um, work really hard and with no attitude. So guys, here's the sad story. I don't know if you guys have read this, but Kanye Nast was sued by their interns for um, overworking them and underpaying them. So now Condé Nast, which is the company that 
owns Glamour Magazine and Vogue and GQ and Details and all the big magazines, they're no longer having an intern, um, um, uh, intern program. And that's sad. Because as much as I'm sure they overworked those young people and treated them crappy, if you could get through that internship program, you would guarantee the job at some great fashion magazine. And so now those opportunities are going to be lost. Which is why I love what, um, what Brandis does, because at Harlem Fashion Row, op she opens up opportunities to guys that look like you. Conde Nast, you know, they think, I think they maybe have three editors of color out of um, a place that has about 20 magazines. That's, that, that's, that's really bad odds for you guys. Um, so, you know, in order to even get the opportunity to play in that space, your game has to be really on point. Explain that. When you say, it, because they, they, I want them to really know what it looks like. Well, you know, when I'm looking at a brand like, I should have made any names because y'all got y'all videotaping. I'm friends with a lot of these brands. But at most brands, they're not, you will not find even a tenth of the staff uh, being black or people of color. Not even, not even a tenth. So some of the brands that you guys absolutely love and you spend so much money on, you're not even represented in the in the workforce. Um, and that's and that's hard. And the ones that are represented, um, that are there are because they are the cream of the crop. You know, you guys are at a great school. HBCUs have great networks. But if you're like a C student, you know what I mean, if you're like a 2.8 GPA, then those nice people that are already in positions of power are not going to be apt to give you the opportunity. You can't wait to get to the big leads and then show out. You got to show out and show up when you have a, 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 a job that you may think really doesn't mean that much. Because we're all a part of, 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 of a bigger world. But we all play our little tiny part in that big world. Of it. So in speaking about kind of showing up and showing out, you've really shown up in terms of fashion queens and what you've been able to accomplish on that show. How did that opportunity come about for you? And what do you what do other doors do you hope it opens? Um, I was cast by Andy Cohen seven years ago, four no eight years seven long time ago for a show called the Tim Gunn Show. Tim Gunn is on Project Runway. And Project Runway used to be on Bravo. And they gave Tim Gunn a spin-off show. And they said that they wanted Tim Gunn to have a female counterpart who could really kind of help him make over women. So I auditioned for the job. By the way, the way I auditioned for the job is that I'm a part of the gay mafia in New York City. And that is a, a, a lovely coterie of, of largely white gay men that kind of run fashion. And um, everyone was hanging out in Fire Island. And they mentioned, one of my dear friends mentioned to Andy Cohen, who was an executive at the time, not a, 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 a TV personality. Um, Andy mentioned that he was casting for the Tim Gunn Show. And a friend who works in fashion, who was very influential, who knew my work ethic, said, my friend Bevy is looking to go into TV. You should call her. Andy had his, his, um, his office call me. I auditioned. I auditioned on a Tuesday. By Thursday, I had the contract saying, they want you to be a part of the show. <laughs> I get the contract and I'm like, oh, this contract is sad times. And so I wasn't able to do it because the contract just wasn't, it, 
it didn't work for me. And so even though I had this great opportunity, it would have been fiscally irresponsible for me to take the position. But Andy was, was awesome, because he, he's, he's one of the best talent scouts in America. Because, I mean, you know, you think about the people that he's found and like really made stars. He's, he's really kind of awesome. But he called me into his office and I went in to see him and he said, you know what? This didn't work out, but we're going to work together. And for seven years, Andy Cohen called me up to do something on Bravo for like all those years. He would just stay in touch with me. He would have me do a pilot. He would have me appear on a show. Like, just always something. And then he came up with the idea of Fashion Queens, and I was um, I was doing a bartending gig on Watch What Happens Live, and when we rapped, he said, I have the show for you now. It's, it's Fashion Queens. And we wrapped that deal in like two weeks. Because wow. when it's right, it's right. Wow. Wow. Um, we also, of course, because of my Fashion Flexible co-stars, we're always, you know, bigging up transgender community, the LGBTQ community as a whole, which is something that's very important because as we can see, that's, the, the future is going to have to be very inclusive. So it's no longer going to be black, white, yellow, it's like all races, all genders, all sexual orientations, we all got to learn to get along. So we, we kind of highlight all those things on our show. And that's why I think really makes us different from the, the rest. What is the absolute best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? Well, no one's ever really get, you know, my mentor, I mentor the same way that my mentor mentored me, which is, my, I have a really amazing mentor, his name is Jeff McKay. And what really makes him so special to me is that he is a wasp. Do you guys know what a wasp is? It's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And these are the people that came over on the Mayflower. Like, so I'm from Harlem, and he's a guy whose family came over on the Mayflower. And we couldn't be more, you know, kind of polar opposites, you would think. But we, we connected on my love of literature and art. And that's how we, that's the language that we spoke to each other. And he was also very much an open-minded person. But my mentor simply showed me opportunities and gave me the keys to his kingdom and let me run. Like I told you when, the, when he said, oh, I want you to go to Paris for the shows. And I was like, when are we leaving? And he's like, no, I'm not going. You go. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but that was him letting me know who he thought I was. Before I even thought about that, before I even thought of myself in that way, he knew I was a global citizen. So now when he sees all my success and stuff, I was recently in the New York Times, and he's just like, it's about time. Because he feels like I should have always had these opportunities. Because when he met me when I was 18 years old, he thought I was already ready for, for my close-up. But I knew I had to take steps. So I mentor in the same way. So I will never really kind of sit you down and like drill something into you. I'm more of the type, oh, so you want to be a stylist? You know what? I'm going to call up my dear friend, Sam, and um, you know, he's actually styling Dylan McDermott tomorrow. And you've got a great eye for menswear, so I'm going to have you shadow him and, and, and assist him. Now you better show up and prove, honey, because you've been given an opportunity. So that's the way I mentor. Or like even the boys on my show, Miss um, Miss Lawrence and Derek Jam, mentor them. Today, right now, I'm here with you guys, and, the, and they're on the real. They're doing the real. And um, you know, I called my babies this morning. I'm like, all right, show, send mommy photos of what you're wearing. <laughs> and then I was like, here's your talking points. And make sure you get this, then, and you know that kind of thing. But it's like. I've given them so much in the time that we've spent together. I know they're, they're, they're going to do a great job. I know they're going to do an awesome job. And so for me, being a mentor is giving you guys the tools, but then letting you go and, and fly and figure it out on your own. Don't keep coming back to the well. Because having a mentor does not mean that you get to call this person every time you can't figure something out. You have to apply yourself. You're smart enough to figure it out on your own. 
And if you really get stuck, then you can make a phone call, but you shouldn't be getting stuck every damn week. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of you in this room are looking for mentors, right? How do you, how do they go about finding a mentor and treating the relationship? Yeah. Well, mentor, having a mentor is really, it's like a, any other relationship. It has to be reciprocal. So if you're my men mentee, what's your name? Shamari Bates. Sh Shamari? Yes, Shamari Bates. So Shamari? Shamari. Mari, yes. And so if Shamari is my men mentee, and she's saying that she wants to be in fashion, when I call Shamari and I'm like, Shamari, girl, I'm about to go and um, do this shoot on, you know, next week. But I really need someone there to take behind the scenes photos and then also to help me tweet things out. I expect Shamari to be there for me. Because when Shamari calls me, it's like, baby, I saw a job application, I mean, a job um, opening for at, at Calvin Klein. Can you call Antoine Phillips for me? I'm going to do that. So Shamari, you better show up for me because I'm going to show up for you. Okay? Okay, it's reciprocal. But I think a lot of times the mentees really feel like they, they kind of take advantage of the mentor. It's like, you're, I, we're there just to serve you, no, we're, we're there to help each other. I wanted to know what was your experience like when you worked with um, rap artists like T.I. and Kanye? Oh, my experience was great. Because I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm what they call an OG. <laughs> um, um, but like, in what, what, what respect do you mean, like, was it hard to be a woman in that space? Or do you mean, was it hard to get them dressed like up. So one of the things I've done too is with my dinner parties, like I've done dinner parties for a lot of young stars. Like so I did dinner for Chris Brown and Trey Songs and uh, so many folks. I did dinner for Kelly Washington, lots of different types of people. And what I find when you're working with any kind of celebrity is that you have to um, acknowledge who they are, but you can't treat them like they are above everyone else. Does that kind of help? Yes. Yeah, it does. Did you have another question, though? I do, but I'm going to let them get there. I don't mind if I just say Okay, okay. But did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Hi, Bethy. I'm Alicia. And I'm actually an intern for Brandis. Woo-hoo! You on the right path. <laughs> so I had a couple questions for you. First, I want to know, how do you define success? What does that look like to you? Success looks like to me when you're doing something that you absolutely love to do and you're being paid for. That is, oh my gosh, you were so successful. My second question is, what has been your favorite career venture or opportunity so far? I've had so many great ones. You know, I really love working at Vibe. One of the greatest things about working at Vibe is that it merged my, my, my uh, love of art and culture, but also my passion for my community. So I was able to go overseas and make people understand that being well-dressed as a black person isn't a fluke. It is a part of our DNA, and it's a part of our legacy, it's a part of our cultural legacy. So I took that picture book over to Europe to show the Europeans that Puffy did not create the fly black guy. This is what we do. Puffy is not fly because he has access. Puffy is fly because his great grandfather was fly. And I want you guys to know that too. You have it in you to be that. Right now, we're way too caught up on labels. Mm -hmm. And as young women, we're way too caught up on looking like Al or Video Vixen. And I know this has nothing to do with the conversation, but I want you guys to know this too. As you are, you are beautiful. There is no one who has got to be the president of a corporation because they have a, a ginormous butt. You don't have to change who you are to succeed in life. Mm -hmm. Don't let them tell you that because the media is, is and that Instagram, uh, everybody thinking they need to be in a waist trainer <laughs> and getting pumped up. And y'all don't need to do that. Y'all are beautiful as you are. I want you to know that your that kind of stuff doesn't really matter in real life. 
it matters to you right now. You think it's such a big deal that you need to have, you know, the perfect hourglass shape, ladies. It, it, no, man. I'm a baby. My name is Devin Rogers, and I'm currently studying apparel design at Georgia Southern. And um, I just recently applied to FIT in New York. Yay, come and be with us! <laughs> and I just recently went there for a tour last week. And while I was there, I kind of felt overwhelmed. And I, I kind of felt as if I didn't want, as if I couldn't really get a start into fashion, especially being black and, you know, being gay. So it just felt like it was almost kind of hard. So what I'm basically trying to ask is what other jobs could I get into besides fashion design? Like what other doors could FIT open? Oh, Angel, you don't turn away from whether it is that you really want to pursue. Doesn't that's going to be hard. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you this secret. It's all hard as an adult. Even if you wanted to go and get a job as a garbage man, it would be hard. Because that's just the way it is. Anything worth having, it's going to be a journey. And it's going to be arduous. And there are going to be times when you're going to be tested. But you cannot back away from that. So if you want to be a fashion designer, what I want you to do is strap on your boots, young man, and you go to FIT, and you don't let them punk you. your innate sensibility, your innate sense of style, and you build on that with the book knowledge that they will give you. And between your, your gift of being a black person, because we're magical, especially when it comes to style. We're magical. You take that innate gift that you have as a young black gay man, which is the most awesome thing I think of the universe. You take that and you marry that with the knowledge that they're about to give you in those books, my love, and you will be an unstoppable force. But first you have to understand that what you're coming to them with is already enough. When I said don't let them punk you, what I meant to say was this. When I took my nephew to Paris, he kept ordering poulet. And I said, why do you keep ordering chicken? We're at a steakhouse. He said, because Auntie Beth, that's the only word I remember out of the book. And I said, well, take out your phrase book. And he was like, I don't want to. I'll be embarrassed. I said, let me ask you a question. You think if they came to Harlem, they would know how to say chitterlings? Would they, they not pronounce collard greens? Would they know what a yam was? He was like, no. I said, exactly. But you know what they would do? They would ask. And I think for us, one of the biggest problems we have is that we're always a very kind of we, we're, we cower about not seeming educated or enough. But ask a question if you don't know something. It's okay. That's right. That's how we talk about it. And I, I was going to say to him, too, to me, New York City is the best place to be um, in terms of building relationships with people. I'm from Memphis. But to me, New York has been such an open place. I think it's how you approach it, right? So what you expect, you usually get. Yes. Um, but I think it's, I think whatever you want is absolutely possible. And I want to talk to you afterwards because I, I just, I'm, I'm very concerned. I don't want you to shy away from fashion design if that's what you really want to do. I just, I don't want you to, what, then you want what, go into something else? Like, because it's easier? I don't want that. I want you to at least try to really be a fashion designer if that is your vision and that's your passion. So we'll have a little chat afterwards. Hi, I'm Stephanie. My name is Danae Sidney and I'm a fashion design major. Um, my question was, I'm the type of person who has a lot of different ideas and a lot of different things going on because I also want to do, like with fashion design, I want to do something like economics, I want to do something like empowerment, I want to do something like ministry. So you do all those things with fashion. Yes, you can. So I was just wondering, like, how do you break it down and start? Like, you start with the one that's closest at your hand. So you say youth empowerment? Yeah, uh, women empowerment. Oh, women's health. Great, awesome. So you're a woman. So let's go and marry some folks. <laughs> so that's what's at our hand, right? And that doesn't take any money. You know what I mean? That just takes you rallying your your friends and 
and making a stand and, and maybe creating a coalition of young women that stand for something and getting the word out there. And then the way you can incorporate your fashion is, you know, if you want to raise money for something, then you're like, let's put on a fashion show. Then all of a sudden your fashion is being fed. Do you see what I mean? But you have to just kind of, what I always say, you always look at the low hanging fruit and then you work from there. And my second question was, we were talking about mentors. I was um, trying to figure out a way that I was going to get into the fashion industry, and I was thinking I should choose someone. Uh, I was trying to watch like Facebook parts. I don't know if that's a good person. I'm sorry, what did you say? I was trying to um, like to take a look at someone to like follow, and I was looking at Facebook parts, and I um, was trying to see, you know, like how do you get a mentor but not stay under them? Like, you know, I don't want a mentor just to be under them, but I want Okay, so what I would say, I always believe the best mentors are the mentors that are right in your backyard. So you you go to, you go there. Yes. You got all these good mentors and these teachers that you have. Right. Your professors can be your mentors. And they are the people that will care for you because they're here not just for the check, but they're here because they're passionate about teaching right. young people. So these are awesome mentors. Mm -hmm. You said Phaedra Parks? Yes. So she fashion. works in fashion? No, I just know that she knows a lot about the law and like different things. So you want to be a lawyer? No, I want to be a fashion designer. Okay, well then why are we talking to people that are lawyers? <laughs> no man paying. No, but what you want to do is you want to align yourself with people who have your same interests. Okay. And, 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 and that can impart knowledge about something that you're not as you know, aware of. So I would say definitely not a major parts, but probably more like, I mean, there's a myriad of, I mean, oh, Michael Knight, who was on Project Runway, who's a base here in Atlanta. Why not Michael Knight as a, as a mentor? Okay. That's a good mentor. If you want to be a fashion designer, he's a fashion designer and he lives here. Yeah. So, you know, you reach out to him and you say, you know what, I would love to intern for you. You know, I'm, I'm willing to come and work. And then, you know, maybe you get lucky enough and he says yes. And then you're on your way. You're working with someone who's a real designer. And you're getting knowledge. And that's awesome. Sound like a good plan? Yeah. Okay. okay. So follow that map tonight on, on social media. Not the people that... <laughs> How is it for you working over in like Paris with like brands like Prada and different things like that? That's all I like to do. I don't know how was your experience. Um, I have to be honest and say that I was so. We were doing this. I have a, a partner in crime named Neil Wilbekin, who was the uh, editor in chief of Vibe, and then he went on to be the editor in chief of Giant, and then he went on to i be the executive editor at Essence. Like, he's a major, major guy. So that was my partner in crime. That was my role dog in Europe. Like, we toured a wide swap through that, that, that region, and we really made moves. Um, so having him with me was really awesome. But also, we were in Europe at a time when hip-hop was going to pop culture, was becoming pop culture. So we were at Vibe and everyone wanted to talk to us because we knew all the stars that were really happening, that were the hip happening stars. So people kind of like were like, oh my God, come to our show, sit in front row, come to the dinner, come to the palazzo, come, you know, it just looks like crazy. <laughs> what I find now overseas is that we're kind of reverting back. I see that there's a lot of um, racism going on. There's certainly a lot of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. That's not you guys' problem. I'm not the one that is Jewish, but there's a lot of racism going on. Um, especially in Paris, there's a lot of anti-immigration kind of moments happening where Af Africans are catching really a bad, bad, they have a, a long and a hard way to go. Um, so I would say that it's always an educational process whenever you're going somewhere and people don't look like you. 
So there's always going to be a time where you're going to have to deal with someone asking you a stupid question. So a question that you feel is stupid, like, you know. Oh my God, yesterday your hair was short, but now it's long. How did that happen? <laughs> well, that's a weave, sweetie. <laughs> but, you know, so there's always going to be kind of like those kind of challenges. But you rise above them and you find your way. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. I know it's so random now, but I really was just trying to think about how we rolled in Europe because we were so happy there, but upon looking back, I think we were just giddy, and so we didn't even take in the fact that a lot of times people were trying to shake us. We just ignored it and grabbed it every time. Hi. Hi, my name is Cindy Mohammed Sellers. I'm a senior business administration major with a concentration in supply chain management. And my question is, with supply chain management, it's pretty much like the operations of a company and logistics side. But I want to incorporate that with fashion. So with the person without any, per se, fashion experience on my resume, how would I like really begin to do that? Because I can apply to jobs, but I think that I would get like really ignored. Oh, because no, you won't, my love. Because what you're going to do is you're going to apply for the operations jobs at a fashion house. Okay. So you know like a Tory Burch, which is a multi-billion dollar brand, They're, they just re um, recently went into a huge expansion. So they would need someone like you. Like I'm sure their operations team is ginormous at this point. So, um, and then I was in Paris like in November, and I'm like minding my business, eating breakfast, and just striking up a conversation with a woman next to me, and it turns out that she was the CFO at Chanel, an American, and it was just like, and that's the kind of job that someone with your degree, like obviously you can't go get that job now, my love, but if you're working and, and, you, and you excel, then again, 15 years, that could be that kind of job that you would have. And she, she gets all the discounts and stuff. She works a bench. And then I had another question, um, piggybacking off of your mentor talk. Um, now, I have a mentor, but the way, I guess, my mentor works and how I was listening to how you work, what do you do when your mentor is, I guess, kind of there but not really giving you any help or any feedback? So you just, like, giving them everything, but they don't really kind of work with you, I guess. Well, then that means that that's not really your mentor. Okay. Yeah, and so you, you need to find someone who can kind of uh, be there for you. I, I want to say this really quick because I know we're going to wrap up and then everyone's only going to ask one question because I have to answer everyone's question that's far. So well, everyone's going to ask one question. But I want to tell them a story about the, the girl who was my assistant. My assistant was my intern at Vod. I hated interns. I wanted nothing to do with them because I like people that I can pay so I can yell at them. <laughs> So, she came to me, she's like, I'm your intern. I'm like, that is so lovely, take care of yourself. I won't be needing you. I show up for a shoot, and I have like, seriously, like 10 rolling racks of clothes and all this stuff. And I notice everything is arranged by price point, color coded, all this stuff. I'm like, oh, the, I guess the photography um, team must have done this for me. It was the girl who was the intern that I sent away. <laughs> she did not take no for an answer. And I was gagging. And to this day, now she is, I have a lot of sons. She is my one daughter. And we work together to this day. And I'm so proud of her. She's an amazing young woman. And she's also, um, she also assists. Do you guys know Vashti? She assists Vashti too. Vashti is one of my little kids too. I have all the major kids. But yeah, so that's my point. Sometimes you have to, you know, kind of be aggressive and assertive about that mentoring thing. And sometimes people will be like, I'm not really interested, but if you show and prove, yeah, show and prove, then people will normally say, yes, come on in. The door is wide open. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're welcome, baby. Now, everyone else has to ask only one question. One question, question ain't quick. Okay. Yes, and I'm going to be quick too, Brian. so okay. you can check. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Aaliyah, and my question is, I know that sometimes we get overwhelmed at being in school because every time we have a guest speaker, it's like you want to write take notes and write down everything and follow the steps. And like, have you ever been so overwhelmed with your greatness? It's just like, how do you tame that beast? Like, do you get the question? Oh, you know what I do? And like, thank you, by the way, for that greatness comment. I don't know about that, but what I do is I take it day by day for me. 
So, um, and it's so funny because even the lovely folks who brought me here, I was like, yeah, okay, I'm gonna get to y'all, but when, wait, I gotta do this on Thursday, so on like Wednesday, we gonna talk. Because I have so much going on that I have to like, I have to organize it in like uh, matters of immediate, you know, that things that need immediate attention. So that's the way I kind of do it. So like tonight I, I leave here and then tomorrow morning I, I have interviews and then I shoot fashion things. And then over the weekend, a job will be But so I just do it day by day. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, baby. So I am a professional fashion from University. And I know the fashion department here is kind of small and not like other schools like Savannah College of Arts and Designs or the Art Institutes. And do you feel as though your schooling determines your opportunity in the fashion industry? No. No. no, I ain't go to school for fashion. I went to school for art. I didn't do my things. No. No. It's, it, and you know, I'm going to tell you this. Most of my friends that are in fashion did not even go to fashion school. <laughs> So it's about the experience. You need that degree, though. I'm going to tell you that because you can't even get a job as a receptionist anymore without a degree. So you need your degree. So awesome that you're in school and you're going to excel and you're going to do great. But do not worry that because your school doesn't have a ginormous fashion department that that means you won't be taken seriously. What it does mean is that you will have to apply yourself that much harder, though, because you don't have. Um, as much access as someone who's maybe going to a SCAD or a FIT or a RISD. Okay, that was a big Oh, no, you don't, you don't have to take one question. Okay. Thank, you. thank you for coming out here. You uh, inspired. Thank, thank, thank you, baby. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jamie Wallace, a graduating senior fashion merchandising major from Brooklyn, New York. So, um, my question is, as being a New York native, there's a lot of competition, as you know. Um, what are three points that you believe you should focus on during the interview? Oh, three points you should focus on in the interview. One, you should make sure that they know your experience. You know, that you should always be very clear about um, knowing how to put forth your experience in a succinct manner. Um, that and that to me, when I whenever I interview people, because I, I don't even I know a lot of people interview me as well. <laughs> but when I interview people, I'm always looking for tell me about yourself. And when I when I say that, I don't just mean tell me that you got a cat or something. I want to know, you know, what you studied in school, what you felt you excelled that, and then I want to know the real pertinent hardcore details about your work experience, no matter how small it was. The other thing I think it's good to focus on when you're in, a, um, in an interview is your people skills. You have to learn how to be affable. You know, you have to speak with a smile. I think a lot of times our young people, you guys are so involved in social media that you don't even know how to approach people with a smile. It's very um, important to make eye contact and also to be um, of good spirits because I'll tell you this, people want to spend money with people they like. People want to give jobs to people that they like. And so if you're a morose Somali, no one's going to want to work with you. Good? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. My name is Giselle Bergeron. I and love these sparkles. Thank you. Yes, I <laughs> Thanks. I actually have a question. You've reached a lot of success with your television as well as everything you've done with past magazines and in fashion. As far as what's next, do you ever see yourself having some type of mentorship or nonprofit, including all of those, the arts, fashion, and everything you said you'd enjoy doing before? You know, I'm a big believer in kind of like, there are already great organizations out there. I would rather lend like my name or lend my help to them. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say in the future I wouldn't want to build my own kind of foundation, but for now I'm just really happy that I get Where to work. You? With, you know, I, I like Grand Samuel's advisory board of HFR. I'm on the board of directors for a really great organization called Cool Culture, which brings art um, education to um, low income families. So I'm able to kind of feel my passions like that for okay. now. But maybe later on. Maybe later. But you know, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Thank you. You know, I'm on the down slope of work. <laughs> I'm trying to be done. <laughs> Um, just recently, I had an interview with um, 
The House of DBF reality TV show, and it was my second season actually trying out, but this time I got a step closer with having an interview with the producer for the show. Um, his name was Brad Ratner. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, but I felt very confident about the interview, but to turn out they had already found the eight girls for the next season of the show, and um, I was wondering, when you're, you know, at your highest and you feel like you've done a, a very well job at what you've, um, you've accomplished as far as like my interview, how do you deal with like adversity and not like really pulling through with what you really wanted to succeed? But you got that much closer the second time, so that should be, you should be like gold star for yourself and know that next time around you're going to go even further. And as a matter of fact, actually you know the man who's the executive producer of that show and also the woman grace who oh, is okay. the head yeah that's yeah, what we're gonna so that's what we're gonna do we're gonna talk afterwards <laughs> and we're gonna see what we can do together. fine arts as well as fashion design. Um, my biggest challenges that I see in students are deadlines and I would like for you to kind of tell them how you go by your deadlines and how important deadlines are in presentations. I know I have a lot of freshmen coming in that don't understand about critiques and presenting if you could just tell them a little about deadlines and presentations in the workforce and how it relates to them as students. Yeah, so thank you so much, Simone, because I mean, it's imperative that you always hit your deadlines. You know, I wake up every morning at 6 a.m., no matter what time I go to bed. So I like to get up with the sun. And um, I like to, you know, look over my daily schedule so that I can like make sure I'm hitting my deadlines. And one of the biggest things for me is that because I am a personality, it's weird. You would think I don't have deadlines anymore, but you know, I have always various magazines and things that want quotes. So during Fashion Week, I had to send in the, um, questions that um, for a serious radio show, I had to do a video for InStyle.com, like all these different things. And there's always a time in which it needs to be delivered. So you could say, oh, it'll be fine if it's 30 minutes late or if it's an hour late, but that's not the case. Before I came here, as a matter of fact, guys, I did a, a spot for People.com. And they went live with the spot. So I had to be camera ready at 8.15 on the dot. There's no excuses. So I can't tell them, oh, um, I, didn't, uh, I don't have on my lipstick yet. I can't do it. No, it's going live. So in life, with your deadlines, you always have to think of it as, if I don't hit this deadline, my life is going to be over. Your parents or yourselves are paying for this college education. So if your, your presentation's not done well, and if they're not done on time, then you're failing. And you're failing yourself. Because those people are going to go on and they're going to still have a career. But what you have is, is a blemish on your record. So you always have to take deadlines very serious. And about presentations, if you don't know how to create a great presentation, then you need to sit down with a friend who does and learn the ropes. Because I hate a, a bad PowerPoint. And um, I'm not doing any of that stuff, by the way. So I have to hire people. But, you know, if I tried to do it, it would be bad, like y'all. But y'all have the way to hire people, so y'all have to learn how to do it well. And they have an art department. And you have an art department. So they can figure it out. Debbie, thank you so much. You have answered every single question. And I want you guys to give yourself a hand because came out in brave weather, and we really appreciate you. So thank you. Again, that you guys are following at 365 Black. 
when you're Instagramming, make sure that you're hashtagging, using the hashtag, hashtag 365 Love and Fashion. I also would love to quickly acknowledge someone that's here from the McDonald's brand. Kristen, if you could just raise your hand. Uh, and just want to thank them again for partnering with Carl's Fashion Row for our HBCU initiatives because you guys need this, right? Yes. You need it bad, right? Yes. <laughs> so say thank you, McDonald's. Thank you, McDonald's, for partnering uh, with us to do this. And thank you, Betty Smith. Thank you, guys.